like it. The only one that messed up was the boy. <laughs> oh, we boys, we got a lot of work to do. We got a lot of work to do. We're going to dismiss the junior church at this time. Grab your Bibles. Let me grab mine. Acts chapter 19, I believe. Unbelievable. 19 already. Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. Let me get situated here. Acts chapter 19. I want to thank AC again for preaching last week in my absence. Appreciate that. Two weeks ago, we were in Acts chapter number 18. And we enjoyed meeting Aquila and Priscilla. What was their occupation? Do you remember Aquila and Priscilla, at least the Aquila and Priscilla of Acts chapter 18? What was their job, AC? They were tent makers. We called them campers because we were using letter C. And Paul met up with them, leaving Timothy and Silas behind. And he met up with them in the city of what? Do you remember Acts chapter 18? Starts with the C, ends in an Orinth. Corinth. All right. So they met up there in Corinth and uh, he was able to meet up with these people, not meet up with them. He met them. He was waiting to meet up with his friends, Timotheus and Silas and Dr. Luke. But at the time, he ends up introducing himself to Aquila and Priscilla at the beginning of chapter 18, found out their occupation. They were tent makers. He was a tent maker. Immediately they had a bond there. He even stayed with them. But even though the fellowship was sweet, he left them and went right to the synagogue, as was his testimony. And he went right to the synagogue and began preaching and teaching. And in the midst of that, after a couple, I don't know how many weeks, but some time had gone by, this particular service, the Bible says the Holy Spirit pressed on him, really impressed on him to preach Christ. Out of all the subjects of the Word of God, the Holy Spirit said, I don't want you talking about Moses. I don't want you talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I want you talking about the Messiah. And he was really pressed by the Spirit to do so. In doing so, in Acts chapter 18, they rejected. The Jews rejected that. They did not want to hear about this new gospel or this thing that was contrary to Moses and the law. They didn't like it at all. And so, really, Paul, filled with the Spirit, says, fine, I'm done with you. I'm no longer going to speak about the Messiah to you Jews. Now, he was not referencing all of the Jews because we know his whole life was patterned with not being a respecter of persons. But this particular crowd, he says, fine, I wash my hands of you. I'm clean of your blood. I have presented the gospel to you. You've rejected it. I'm out of here. He leaves and he goes right next door to a house, the Bible says, that was pressed up to the synagogue right next door. To the church. Does anybody remember who the man of the house was? Starts with a J, ends in Ustis. Justice, good job. You guys are on it today. And so Justice right next door was a man of God already, and he met them, and some other things happened, and he went to, to, um, to bed that night, Paul did, and he no doubt was excited about giving the gospel and seeing people baptized that day. But no doubt in his mind there were these Jews that he told them, I'm done with you. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says, I'm done with you. And no doubt as a soul winner, he understood that if they died without Jesus Christ, they'd spend eternity in hell. And that bothered him. Well, he went to sleep that night after no doubt rehearsing to Aquila and Priscilla the events of the day. And while he was asleep, the Bible says that he had a vision. And in this vision from the Lord, Almighty God spoke to him and told him to fear not. You just keep doing what I have designed you to do, and you'll be fine. You will not suffer harm. You just keep doing what I have designed you to do. And what a blessing that was. And Paul continued on in Acts 17 and Acts 18, and we find ourselves in Acts 19. Now, I don't believe I did very well at the end of 18. The end of 18 ends up with Aquila and Priscilla. Remember, they were from where originally? These were Jews in the city of Corinth. But do you remember where they were from? Starts with the R, ends in Ohm. Rome, good job. And so they were from Rome, and the king said, Jews, you guys get out. Get out. 
And so they were strangers, immigrants, foreigners in Corinth. And as they were continuing to travel, selling their goods of being uh, tent makers, they found themselves going, well, we need to go to the synagogue. It's the Lord's day. And, and so they went. And as they went, if you will, to church, I want to start somewhere down in verse 24. They find a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures who came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. So he got up, he's preaching, speaking eloquently, doing the dead level best he could with all that he knew. And the Bible says he only knew of the Lord, only knowing the baptism of John. But regardless, he got up and with fervency and eloquence of speech, he got up and he preached boldly. Verse 26, and he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, so they sat in the service. He's speaking boldly. They're listening intently. And after the service, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Because he only understood the way or the baptism of John the Baptist. And they, he only, the, uh, Apollos only understood a little bit about what he knew. And yet he spoke boldly. He possibly says some things that were actually counter to what the gospel is. And so Aquila and Priscilla, just laymen, was not pastor and Mrs. Pastor. It was man of God, wife of a man of God, who were just faithful to the house of God, even in a strange place. But they said they grabbed the preacher and they expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. That means a layman who studied on his own, who was faithful at home in his church, now stuck exiled out of his home, still being faithful to the house of God, was able to educate Apollos, a man of God, who was fervent, who was eloquent, who the Bible says, I believe, even mighty in Scripture, verse 24, mighty in Scripture. They were still able to say, you know what, you got some things wrong, let us help you with that. And the Bible says at the end of verse 26, they expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Make sure I turn this on. I did. Praise the Lord. Now notice verse 27. And when he had, he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exerting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much uh, which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. So, after this encounter Apollos had with Aquila and Priscilla, he did not get filled with pride, but he grew and was able to convince many Jews. What, what did he convince them? He showed them the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. So he didn't quit. That's where we ended two weeks ago. Now we find ourselves in chapter 19. So if you're taking notes, we're still thinking about this man, Apollos, at least initially. But notice verses 1 and 2, we see what I call the babes. The babes or the babies. Specifically, the Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. So when I say the babies, I'm specifically talking about baby Christians. I had an encounter a little bit ago with someone that was called a babe in Christ. The reason he did this is because he's a baby in Christ. And I think to myself, babies should be nurtured with what? Milk. The reason babies grow is because of the milk. And I thought to myself about this individual who acted the way he did. And, and the other individual said, well, he's just a baby in Christ. I thought, well, maybe he's drinking water and not milk. Because I don't see growth in his life. 
And he shouldn't act this way. And I, I know we're flesh and I know we do things, but I just, I've known this person long enough to go, I don't see any fruit. I don't see any growth. And maybe if he's a babe in Christ, he's drinking water and not milk. And so it's important for us to understand we ought to desire the sincere milk of the word that we may grow by the Bible. But verses 1 and 2, we see what I call the babies. Notice verse 1. And it came to pass, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. And finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. So these are babies. These are believers who believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Messiah but they didn't even know who the Holy Spirit was. So what do we do? We get mad at babies. We get, we just say, what is wrong with you? How do you not know? We don't beat them up. We feed them milk. We help them to grow. I, I'm thankful our youngest child turned two on Friday. And I'm thankful. He looks like he's like three, maybe even four. He's so tall. And when I look at him, I see evidence of growth. And here in verse 1 and 2, if someone says something that is counter to the word of God and our response is to just kick them out, we've got a problem. We're not giving them an opportunity to grow. And so in verse 1 and 2, we see these. Notice the word it says at the end of verse 1. Somebody say that out loud. The last word of verse 1. It is what? Disciples. The word of God calls these babies disciples and yet in verse 2 they didn't even know who the Holy Ghost was well you can't be saved if you don't know understand the dispensation that's going on here in Acts the Holy Ghost this is all new just a few minutes ago in Acts chapter 1 Jesus ascended back to heaven and said man of God go to upper room Baptist Church and be still the Holy Ghost is coming well, to them, it's like, we've seen the Holy Ghost. We felt the presence of the Holy Ghost. I've been filled with the Holy Ghost. But what Jesus was saying is he's coming to stay. And now we see these babies, these disciples. Verse 2, that he said unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost? And she believed. And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. They were babies. Apollos who was mighty in scripture and eloquent and even the preacher that day was also a baby. Aquila and Priscilla had to come to him in verse 26 of the last chapter and say, can we explain to you in a more mature, perfect way the scriptures? And because he was humble and received that instruction from this beautiful couple in the word of God, he was later able to be used to reach many Jews and able to help them because he was humble and received that reproof and that rebuke. But now continue past the babies in Christ to the baptisms with an S. The baptisms in verses 3 through 7. 3 through 7. The Bible says, and he said unto them, unto what then were you baptized? If you don't know about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, what were you baptized then? And they said unto him, excuse me, uh, uh, unto what then were you baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. So, oh, we were baptized unto John's baptism. Now understand, Apollos, all he knew before Aquila and Priscilla was John's baptism. And so right now he hears them say, we were baptized unto John's baptism. And he's going, oh man, I'm going to help them. I'm able to help them because I was willing to receive correction from the man of God and his wife just a little bit ago. Notice verse 4. Then Paul, uh, um, then Paul, then said Paul, there I'm looking for said after Paul. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Verse 5, 
When they heard that, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. He said, guys, that was just the baptism of repentance. And they're like, oh, there's more? You mean I'm supposed to grow? A baby is in Christ is supposed to desire the sincere milk of the word that they may grow. And they sat there and they heard Paul expound unto them and teach them. And so what the Bible says at the end, when they heard this verse 5, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse 6. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And so we've got these multiple different baptisms going on in these verses. The baptism of John, the baptism of actually being baptized, and then the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's all here. Notice verse 7. And all the men were about 12. Now go back to chapter 18, verse 25. I've already alluded to this. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. Maybe these babies in Christ were faithful to the services that Apollos was teaching. But Apollos wasn't able to teach them everything because Apollos didn't understand everything about the gospel, about the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ, about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And so it's important for us to understand preachers should preach what they know. But pastors cannot be novices. They have to be mighty in scripture, yes, but they have to understand at least the bare minimum of who Jesus is and how to get to heaven and what baptism is and what it's not and what speaking in tongues is and what it's not. A pastor cannot be a novice. But Apollos was fervent in the spirit and he did the best he could with what he had, but he was teachable. And as he learned some things, and even Paul is explaining even more that there's different baptisms. And these disciples understood, wow, well, we want to please God. We're willing to do whatever. And a sign of that is the Holy Ghost was approved and came on them. And then they spake in tongues and prophesied, showing proof on the outside what they had on the inside. Notice verses 8 through 10, the boldness. And I hesitate. I always want to stop every time I read the word tongues in the Bible. I feel like I ought to spend 30 minutes on it. And we've addressed it already, but, but man, I just feel like it needs to be addressed every single time. But, but we've done that, and I'm sure I'll do it again in the future. But for now, verses 8 through 10, the boldness. And he went into the synagogue and spake. What's that next word, verse 8? He went into the synagogue and spake boldly. I want to remind you that he had a vision in the night back in chapter 18, verse 9. He had a vision in the night that said, be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. That was back in Corinth. But understand that he's continuing that boldness. Verse 8. Of chapter 19 and he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months that must have been nice for Paul I mean a couple minutes ago we're reading chapter 17 where hey they're gonna throw you in prison at a minimum and they might want to kill you so he leaves by night he says Timothy Silas Luke come catch up with me when you can I'm heading out and then in chapter 18, he heads out and he, he's continually used by God. But now we see in chapter 19, he gets to hang out a little bit for the space of three months. Verse number eight. Disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. Remember in chapter one, Jesus says, I'm leaving. And they said, you're leaving. Is now is it is it kingdom time now? And Jesus says, guys, don't worry about that. That's not for you to know. What you need to know is you're going to receive power. And the Holy Ghost is going to come upon you, and you're going to be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost. Don't worry about the end times. Let's worry about right now and let's be witnesses. Well, now we see Paul disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. So these people are so concerned about things. And Paul is saying, boy, you guys need to get it. 
You need to understand it. You say, what do you mean? Look at verse 9. But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of Tyrannius. And this continued by the space of two years, so that, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. You may have missed it, but look at verse 10. So that all they which dwelt in where? What do you think about when you see that? Asia. Yeah. Remember that? They're looking for a place to take the gospel. They're like, oh, Asia. Asia needs the gospel. And the Holy Spirit says no. Not no, Asia doesn't need the gospel, but no, not right now. Remember that? We ended up in Philippi. We ended up getting locked up, singing praises. Philippian jailer gets saved. All that happened. And now, just a couple chapters later, we see the gospel going through the entire region of Asia. The Bible says, all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. This would not have happened if Paul weren't bold. We need to be bold. We need to be mighty in the scriptures and we need to be willing to trust and stand on the promises. This morning, uh, Alex led the song, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And as a result of his boldness, all of Asia, who no doubt it hurt him to not go there initially a few chapters back, now he's there for two years and the whole region gets to hear the gospel. Verses 11 through 12. We're now going to see the blessings, the miracles, <clears throat> the blessings, the blessings. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. Wouldn't that be awesome to be used by God to execute special miracles? And I'm not trying to say modern day mess. I just mean to be used by God to do something special for God. But understand at this moment of our text, Paul's story doesn't start here. We don't have the time, nor do I have the energy to go back to Acts 9 and bring us all the way up 10 chapters later to the point where God says this about Paul. I'm using him to perform special miracles. We can't quit. It's all throughout the Acts. It's all throughout the Bible. We've got to allow the Holy Spirit to have His will and His way and His work in our life. And now and at this moment, two years of preaching the gospel and disputing and persuading in Asia, that God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. So that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs of apron or aprons handkerchiefs or aprons and the diseases departed from them and the evil spirits went out of them so god is using the man of god to perform these special miracles the whole city recognizes it everyone understands what's going on they're coming to him and they're bringing their sick they're bringing even handkerchiefs. They're bringing aprons. That's why we have uh, stations like TBN that are just wicked. And they're really, don't chase that rabbit. They get this from here. Understand that evil people desire a sign. We now live by faith. This book is complete. I will never get up, never. If I'm biblical, I will never get up and say I have a new truth. I have a new, you know, God spoke to me last night, a new thing. Just put your Bibles away. This is new. And as a man of God, you don't need your Bible because he gave it to me. And you can't get it, Brother Reggie, you can't get what I got because he spoke to me as a prophet. If I ever say that, please run. Run. I don't care if your last name's Harold. Run. This is a completed word. I do not have the privilege or the lying ability to get up 
and prophesy something that's outside of this book. There's, no, there's nothing new that I can give you. And so in this moment, this dispensation of time, again, acts as this, this, this moment from Old Testament law to grace to Old Testament to now the church of the living God. It's all happening now. Ordaining elders in every city, pastors, being, the church is on the move. It's great. But in this moment, God used Paul to be a blessing to many, many people. In fact, verse 12 says, so that from his body, verse 11, even his hands were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons and the diseases departed from them and the evil spirits went out of them. We've been praying even for Sister Gina's neighbor and, and sister. I wish I had the ability to go to them and just lay hands on them and heal them. If there's a man in Los Angeles that can do that, why do they ever leave the hospital? If I had the ability to heal the sick, why would I ever go home? I would just make a bed in the ER, and everyone that came through would immediately go right back. Why would I hoard that ability? Unless I'm a hireling. AC, come up here and limp the whole way. Because something's wrong with your leg. <laughs> and this is what we have. I just feel someone in the audience today has a problem with their leg. And I got a little earpiece. Come on up. Uh, and I think his name is, is, is AC. Are you AC? You've got a problem in your right leg. Right leg, right? right. You said right leg, right? Okay, right leg. And, and, and they just go through it. Now, I'm not going to play the game, but we've seen it. They're not faith healers. They're fake healers. There's none of that going on today. The, what was happening here in Acts 19 and throughout the scripture was given for a sign to point people to Jesus Christ. But now today, what they're doing is they're doing it for filthy lucre. So what is our weapon against the ER room? It's prayer. It's going to the elders. It's anointing them with oil. It's laying hands on them, saying, Holy Spirit, you're the great physician, not me. And we acknowledge that. And we're asking you to do what only you can do. And we end the prayer with, in Jesus' name, which means if it's not your will for them to make it through this, give us the strength to live without them. And let their death be a tool in your hand to be used for your purpose. Yesterday at the funeral, the last preacher got up and reminded us that God knows exactly what he's doing and none of us have any idea. That was good. That helped me. We try to put God in a box and we try to figure it out. But listen, he is sovereign. He's all knowing. He understands why Brother Eric took his last breath and is now in heaven. He understands what he's doing. So it is our responsibility, as we sang this morning, to trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And, and I believe this 100% that people brought their handkerchiefs, that people brought their aprons. I believe 100% that people, when they walked by, or when Peter, I think it was, that walked by, or maybe it was Paul, but his shadow was cast, they were healed for, I believe that. All that happened, all those blessings and all those miracles were given as signs to point people to Jesus. But now we have literal criminals behind pulpits robbing God's people, preaching another gospel, which is not another. And yet here the man of God was used mightily to perform real miracles. But now notice Acts chapter 19, verses 13 through 16. We're going to verse 41, so speed it up, preacher. Verse 13 through 16, what I call the blunder. The big mistake, a blunder here. Look at verse 13 through 16. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcist, took upon them to call over them, which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord, uh, uh, to call over them, which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, 
we adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jew, and a chief of the priests, which did so. So get the picture. You've got these men who are trying to cast out devils, but notice how they say it. At the end of verse 13, they're trying to cast out devils. We adjure you by Jesus. They could have put a period there. They should have put a period there, but they didn't even know who Jesus was for themselves. So this is what they're saying. We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. Verse 14, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priest, which did so. Seven sons of a priest were doing this. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know. And they're like, yep. Paul, I know. Yeah, we do too. But who are you? Who are ye? These seven sons of a priest were trying to cast out a devil, and they said, we adjure you, command you, demand it of you, by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. And the demons were like, okay, whom G Jesus whom Paul, Jesus I know, whom Paul preached, Paul I know, but who are ye? You seven. Who are you? Who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on. Let me read that again. And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. I call this the blunder because these guys were trying to be like Paul instead of trying to be like Jesus. And it is a huge mistake. Listen, especially preacher boys, don't try to be like Paul. Don't try to be like another preacher. Try to be like Jesus. Don't even try. Be like Jesus. And these men missed a step. They thought we could have the blessings of the miracles that Paul has if we do what Paul is doing. But they didn't understand that Paul's story started way back in Acts chapter 9. And even before that, as he was consenting unto the death of Stephen in chapter 6 and 7. And that kicking against the pricks that was going on that finally they got to talk about in Acts chapter 9. And now in 19, Paul is doing amazing things. And we think that happened overnight. And the seven sons of a priest said, we could do that too. And the demon understood because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. The demons are smarter than these seven sons of the priest. And they said, you got no power against us. And they got on them to the point that they're beating themselves and ripping their clothes and running out of the city naked. What a blunder. A blunder. Verse 13 says, then certain of the vagabond, that word vagabond, it's a long definition, but the Bible, or excuse me, that word vagabond, the Bible uses the word vagabond, that word means a vagrant, one who wanders from town to town or place to place, having no certain dwelling or not abiding in it. By the laws of England and of the United States, vagabonds are liable, liable to be taken up and punished before Joe Biden was our president. And so a vagabond is not a good thing. That's what title the seven sons of a priest were given. A vagabond. You know what that tells me? The seven sons of a priest weren't church members. They were just going all over. Where are we going to go this Sunday? Where are we going to go this Sunday? I'm not saying they went to church. They were just vagabond. Listen to it again. A vagrant. One who wanders from town to town. Why, won't they, why weren't these seven sons of a priest with their father serving God? But they didn't even know their father's God. To the point that they're trying to cast out devils in the name of Paul's God. They're vagrants. They were wandering from town to town or place to place, having no certain dwelling or abiding in it. 
Why would seven sons of a priest not have a certain place to abide? Again, by the laws of England and of the United States, vagabonds, vagrants, are liable to be taken up and punished, or at least they used to be. What a blunder. What a mistake. Do we see vagabonds today on TBN and other religious states? Yes, we do. These people are grabbing for money. Instead of giving God the glory, wouldn't it be nice if just one of these men and ladies now would get up and say, you know, I'm a con. I'm a fraud. I live on an $8 million spread. I've got my own private jets. I've got multiple cars. And you're sending me money because we're sending you a handkerchief saying we're going to help your cancer. We can't help your cancer. I am a fraud. I've never heard that. The only time I've ever heard any type of big time preacher get up is when they're caught in adultery. And then it's, I'm sorry. And then soon after they're back at it. So these seven sons of Sceva heard from a demon. Jesus, I know. Hey, by the way, that's nice to know. That the demons know who Jesus is. Jesus, I know. That preacher, I know him. But who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them. Can an evil spirit leap on a believer? No or no? <laughs> no. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We can be oppressed by evil spirit, but we cannot be possessed by evil spirits. But the seven sons of Sceva did not have the Holy Ghost in them. And so there was room. They gave place to the devil. The devils. And so what a blunder. Let's continue. Verse 17 through 18. The belief. The belief. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus. And fear fell on them all. Wouldn't it be nice if we had an event, and I've got to be careful, this isn't a prayer request, but wouldn't it be nice if we had an event in America that would provoke all Americans to fear God? That's not a prayer request because I don't know if I'm... I mean, do you understand that, that type of statement? What, what would God have to do to shake our nation, to get our nation to return back to Him? That would be a tremendous amount of tragedy. Because luxury does not breed repentance. Go back to the children of Israel. Look at every time they were eating fat off the calf. What did they do? They started worshiping idols. They started drinking, started getting naked. And then God showed up and broke them down. And then they repented. And then they built back up. And then they forgot God. It's a horrible pattern. And so here, though, because of the seven sons of Sceva, we all of a sudden now, what I call the belief, verse 17, this was known through all the land, and fear fell on all of them. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. You know what they did? They did what Zacchaeus did. They met Jesus. They repented. And they said, look, if I've done wrong, whatever, whoever I stole from, I'll return it. They begin to express their deeds outwardly of the repentant heart inwardly. Their belief determined their behavior. Speaking of behavior, verses 19 and 20, we'll see their behavior. We were already told about their deeds in verse 18, but notice their behavior. But our behavior usually shows or demonstrates our beliefs. So notice their behavior in verse 19 and 20. Many of them also which use curious arts brought their books together 
and burned them before all men. So they didn't just say, oh, how I love Jesus. They proved it. They said, preacher, do we have church tonight? Oh, yeah, we have church tonight. Okay, great. When I come back tonight, can we have like a bonfire outside? Say, oh, yeah, I like roasting marshmallows. No, 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 preacher. You always think about food, AJ. We're not talking about bonfire marshmallows. I'm talking about bringing my curious arts. In today's term, I'm talking about bringing my porn. I'm talking about bringing my bad music. I'm talking about bringing the things that do not give God glory in my life. I'm bringing my curious arts. I'm bringing these books that have no business on my bookshelf. I want to bring them together, verse 19, and burn them before all men. And they counted the price of them. So when they did this, they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. As a result of this belief and this behavior, verse 20, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Does America need that? Yes. Then we need to burn up our books. Then we need to get serious about it. We don't need to say, I'm not going to read this book anymore and put it on the shelf so that when we fall into temptation, it's just right there. We need to burn it up. Burn up the books. And as a result of their belief, and now because of real repentance, they are now walking in newness of life. They burned up the books and God sees that. And the word of God grew mightily and prevailed. Prevailed. Notice verse 21 through 23, the Bible. We end in verse 20, the word of God grew mightily and prevailed. But notice verse 21 through 23, the Bible, or specifically the Bible way. Verse 21, after these things were ended, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. Verse 22. So he went into Macedonia, two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a season and the same time, there arose no small stir about that. What is that last word? About that way. What way? The Bible way. When we have beliefs founded on the word of God, our behavior changes and other people take notice of our way of how we walk. Um, see if I can get this real quick. This morning, uh, in my secret place, I ought to just start printing them on Sundays because it just seems like I keep going back to them. But this morning in my secret place, as I read the Word of God, I came across this verse, Isaiah 62, verse 12. This was my gold nugget for today. In fact, I'll just read it to you. Read my, my whole uh, devotional. What I wrote this morning was, Does the world recognize you as one of his does the world recognize you as one of his is your light shining bright enough in the dark world to make any impact at all does your family know you are a believer is your testimony at work strong enough that your co-workers know that you are a believer do your neighbors know that you are a believer as I read this morning in my secret place, I found this gold nugget which brought these and other questions to mind. Isaiah 62 verse 12 says, And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and thou shalt be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. Does my life resemble that of a biblical believer? Do the unsaved around me call me holy, redeemed, sought out, and not forsaken by the Lord during these harsh and difficult days? That was my devotions from this morning, Isaiah 62, 12. Does the world look at us and do they say, 
That person is called out. That person is holy. That person is redeemed. That person is sought out. That person is a city not forsaken by the Lord. When I read that this morning, I thought, wow, and now that we're preaching through this and we get here to this Bible way in verses, uh, where are we at? In verses 21 through 23. Notice verse 23 again. And this, at and the same time, there arose no small stir about that way. Do people know that you walk in newness of life? Go back to last or two weeks ago when I preached the last chapter. Go back to the beginning of this chapter. Or are you a baby in Christ? If you're a baby in Christ, that's fine. Desire the sincere milk and grow. So that's the Bible way. Verse 24 through 27. I'm going to speed this up. 24 through 27, the businessmen. The businessmen, verse 24 through 27. You guys are doing great. Verse 24 through 27, the businessmen. Verse 24. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of and said sirs ye know that by this craft we have our wealth verse 26 moreover ye see and hear that not along uh, not alone at Ephesus but almost throughout all Asia this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people saying that they be no gods which are made with hands so that not only this, our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised and her magnificence should be destroyed. Whom all Asia and the world worship. I call this the businessman, and what I'm going to do to do the rest of this chapter justice, we're going to stop here today. Because I really, I really want to spend more time on the businessman. I can give you the next two points if you want to study it on your own, verses 28 through 34. The blasphemers, we're going to look at next week, verses 28 through 34, the blasphemers. And then lastly, next week, we'll look at the behavior, verses 35 through 41. But I'm going to stop here because I really, I just believe we've done enough today. And, and I was prepared to go to 41, but I just believe we've done enough today. Let's just recap really quick and we'll be done. We started the chapter, which was a continuation of the previous chapter, with Apollos and his disciples and Paul educating them about the various baptisms. And they, as babes in Christ, were like, teach us more. If there's a baptism of the Holy Ghost or a baptism of the Lord, I want it. I want whatever God has for me. And so because of that attitude, it provoked a boldness in Paul as he continued and he's preaching and he's teaching and people are getting saved, people are getting baptized, and God is using Paul in such a great way that now he's a blessing to anyone who would come to him with any type of illness or disease. He was having special miracles to the point that everyone that came to Paul was being healed. Well, as a result of this, you've got seven brothers. We're like, hey, we could do this. Vagabonds. And they're thinking we could do this. No big deal. What did he say? In the name of Jesus. In the name, write that down. In the name of Jesus. Uh, I adjure thee. I adjure thee. All right. All right. We got it. We got it. We practice. We're good. Let's go find someone that's demon possessed. And they found someone demon possessed. They made a huge blunder thinking it was about their performance and not the presence of the Holy Ghost. And they said, I adjure thee by the name of Jesus whom Paul preacheth. And we just heard the story. Who are you? Who are you? And they were demon possessed and cast out. And can you imagine men being a father, serving God, a priest, and your sons don't follow God? Can you imagine? Just you're all in with God and you're serving God in the temple and you're a priest and your seven sons 
are possessed with demons because they never bought in. They never surrendered. And we see the blunder of those boys. But then we learn that our belief determines our behavior. And when we act out our Christianity, the world says they're of this way. Next week, we're going to pick up here in verses 24 through 27 about these businessmen. Understand, as Paul is preaching, and he's saying things like this, like he said back in Corinth, you guys are superstitious. You got idols everywhere. In fact, you've got an altar to the unknown God. Let me help you out. There's only one God, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one hope. And these people heard the gospel and they're like, wait, Jesus is the Messiah? We believe. So as a result of believing, their behavior changed. And now they're not worshiping idols, nor are they going down to the idol workshop, nor are they going to the temple of Diana. Because we believe in Jehovah. We believe in Jesus. We believe in the Most High God. And as a result of this, we're going to see next week, the businessmen begin to lose some business. So they had a meeting of the minds. And we got to do something about Paul. I hope I wet your whistle enough. We're going to pick up there next week. We're going to pick up here in the middle of the chapter and finish it out next week. But understand, church, we have a responsibility. We have a God-given responsibility. Going back to how we started this service, 13 men, 13 military members gave their life for this country and for the peace of the world. That's a big deal. But greater than that is one man gave his life for you and for me. Help us to have the boldness of Paul and the assuredness of Stephen that I'm going to preach Christ whether you stone me or not. I'm going to never let up. Let's have that same audacity to just say, here am I, Lord. Send me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this portion of Acts 19 that we looked at. And as we pick up next week, help us to understand this week that we should not be secret agent Christians. There's no such thing. Help us to let our light so shine before men. I think I have never been to a funeral where it was said of the person who passed that not one person had anything negative to say about him. Former co-workers were there, church members, family members, his own children. That was a man who loved you. What an example. Paul was a man who loved you. What an example. You and your word commanded us to be an example of the believers. So help us to take these examples and let our light so shine. Understanding that death is an appointment that every one of our loved ones, every one of our co-workers, our neighbors, even our foes, they have an appointment with death that they're not going to miss. Even in the Word of God where that man asked for more time and you extended his life, he still died. Help us to realize only one life will soon be passed.